Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the world. Three days, 50 sessions, 300 speakers. We're at the end of this. This is the last, the closing panel with a group of very, very distinguished speakers. And we want to take up the theme that has been uh, moving through the whole World Health Summit this year, international cooperation, cooperation between countries, cooperation between agencies, cooperation between many stakeholders. Uh, the session just before this has focused on UN organizations and the cooperation on occasion of 75 years of the United Nations. This uh, session will focus on a big innovation that was created a couple of years ago, the so-called Global Action Plan that uh, brings together 12 organizations uh, that work together uh, to implement particularly SDG3, but all the other components also of other SDGs to contribute to achieving health. And some of the uh, contributors to this action plan were with us in the previous session, the Global Vaccine Alliance, UNDP, UNFPA. And uh, this time around, we have uh, here with us the representatives of another group of the agencies that are contributing to the action plan. We have uh, Henrietta Faure, the Executive Director of UNICEF. We have Mohamed Pate, the Director of the Global Financing Facility and also the Global Director of Health, Nutrition and Population at the World Bank. We have Peter Sands, the Executive Director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. And we have the chair of the executive board of UNITAID, Marisol Touraine. We also have with us Professor Jeremy Farrar from the Wellcome Trust in the UK, and of course, uh, the director of the coordinating agency, uh, Dr. Tedros, the director general of the WHO. And it is my great pleasure to ask Dr. Tedros to give us the introduction to this panel to tell us where does the Global Action Plan stand and what are the challenges that uh, we have before us in this very innovative cooperation, the synergies it creates, and maybe, but we'll discuss that a little bit later, perhaps the synergies with some of the new initiatives that have also been created in the face of COVID-19. Please, Dr. Tedros, the word is yours to set us off. Thank you. Thank you, Ilona. Um, esteemed guests, dear colleagues and friends, a guten tag. And my sincere thanks to our co-hosts, the German Ministry of Health and the organizers of the World Health Summit. Thank you, Delta, Delta for, for, join, for joining today. I can see you in the window. Uh, it was at this summit two years ago that we made our initial commitments to the global action plan. And it was one year ago that it was officially launched. I want to take this opportunity to thank their excellencies, the Chancellor of Germany, the Prime Minister of Norway, and the President of Ghana for jointly challenging us to develop this ambitious plan. We're grateful for their continued support and leadership in health. Last month, the first progress report was published. It's heartening to see on paper commitments turned into real life action. Of course, the plan was launched in what now seems like a very different world, which was not yet coping with many challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this different context, the global action plan is more important than ever. COVID-19 is exposing and amplifying the inequalities in our societies and the gaps in our health systems. The pandemic has undoubtedly set us back in our collective work to achieve the sustainable development goals. To get back on track, our efforts need to be redoubled. The Global Action Plan provides a platform to improve 
how we work together, providing a pathway to a more effective use of limited resources. Collaboration and innovation are the key ingredients to support countries' efforts to recover from COVID-19 pandemic and accelerate progress towards the SDGs. I have made a stronger collaboration with our partners, one of my top priorities at WHO. Under the Global Action Plan, 12 multilateral agencies have come together to improve the ways we work together. Changing our organizational cultures is challenging and takes time, but we're determined to make progress and to enhance our cooperation in support of national plans and priorities. Governments must show leadership and so must civil society. It's their job to challenge us and tell us how we can do better. My fellow principals and I must be leaders. We must ensure broad ownership and make these goals part of everyone's daily work, not just a voluntary add-on. We must empower members of staff to lead, to find ways to achieve impact through a stronger collaboration of our agencies and in translating our commitments into action. At the end of the day, results are what really matter. And I'm really encouraged by what is happening in the ACT Accelerator, where many of our agencies are participating and showing true leadership. That's the essence of GAP also. And we're doing it. It's now a matter of expanding it and using it in a wider, in a wider engagement, like achieving the sustainable development goals. I'm really glad to see my colleagues today joining on this. Most of you as members of the ACT Accelerator, we have shown that cooperation of agencies is possible. It's like taking the ACT Accelerator into the gap. So I'm really proud to partner with you. And with the continued engagement and support of everyone here today, I know we can succeed together. I thank you. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank, Dr. Tedros. It's wonderful to have you uh, here with us to uh, give us uh, this introduction and also the challenges that come with it. You've said it that uh, it's been a great step forward in cooperation between agency for a long time. There was much uh, criticism about vertical programs and not working together. I think we really are in a different time now. And I'd like to turn to Marisol from uh, Unitaid and say, you know, how are you experiencing this synergy, this complementarity? Uh, what is it so Unitaid is particularly committed to innovation, uh, to trying to move the whole field of global health into new venues and new forms of working together. How is your experience with the gap, with this form of cooperation and what does Unitaid bring to the table? Thank you very much, Ilona. I want to say uh, hello to uh, all my colleagues and to Dr. Tedros, of course. Thank you, uh, Detlef, for organizing this summit. And I understand how complicated it must be for you. And uh, I'm pretty sure we would all have preferred to join in Berlin and, and, and be in this nice city. Um, as uh, Dr. Tedros explained, um, it's extremely important to defend collaboration and partnerships. Uh, collaboration and partnerships are the admissible tools for achieving the SDGs and for implementing, implementing uh, universal health coverage. And um, I, I am deeply convinced that in the COVID-19 context, it is very important, it is essential for us to remind how collaborating together is crucial to achieve our common goals. Um, it's very important because we are living a time when some countries, some governments, maybe some leaders um, would like to accuse multilateral institutions and international cooperation of all evils. And facing this situation, we have to defend cooperation and partnerships. In any case, 
um, collaboration belongs to the uh, DNA of uh, UNITED. We invest in innovative approaches and programs, and we count on our partners to scale up the most successful of them. And so uh, I, I will make three very quick points. First, why is uh, cooperation so important for uh, our agencies and so important to achieve SDG3 and universal health coverage? I see three main reasons. The first is that uh, cooperation makes our country's interventions more effective by better responding to country needs and increasing our impact on vulnerable populations. Uh, the gap, and that's my experience, unique experience of the Global Action Plan, does not propose new policies, but aims to help countries to better implement health strategies. It also allows to reduce the burden on countries in terms of management and coordination of different programs, and we know it's quite important. The second reason why cooperation is so important is that each of our organizations is complementary and thus brings specific expertise. We experience that every day on the field. And last, uh, coordinated and joint actions are essential to ensure the coherence of our projects, without which we wouldn't be able to guarantee we actually meet patients' needs. And I think that what moves us is to be, a, to, to be sure that we reach people, the right people, the people who need us. Um, so, um, in my perspective, in my perception, uh, the Global Action Plan has become somehow the symbol of this common will to join forces to serve populations. As I said, and that will be my second point, collaboration uh, has been at the core of UNITED's method since the beginning. We joined the gap precisely to share our expertise in bringing innovations to people who need it the most uh, through close collaboration with you, all the people who are sitting around this virtual table this afternoon, uh, where we work with the Global Fund uh, on an almost everyday basis. We work with, uh, uh, of course, uh, Jeremy Farah and Welcome Trust uh, in ACTA and, 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 and uh, uh, with all of you and with WHO and under the umbrella of WHO. And UNITED played a significant role in shaping the aligned commitments under the plan to bring uh, concrete gains to the global response, particularly on information, knowledge, and data. And um, we see from our point of view, the Global Action Plan as an opportunity to uh, leverage what we already do and take it to a next level. I would like to give you a precise example because people who listen to us don't know exactly what we do uh, every day. Um, to show you how UNITED thinks and acts in a collaborative way. Uh, I would like to talk about the uh, work we have done on pediatric uh, TB. When UNITED identified the first new child-friendly formulations against TB, pediatric, uh, pediatric TB, we discovered a very simple treatment that improved child survival. So what was the problem to address? Uh, the deaths of over 140,000 children every year from tuberculosis. Uh, that means more than 380 children every day dying every year. And we needed to uh, invent to find something. So we funded the STEP TB project with WHO and TB Alliance. We developed appropriate treatments for children. And now we estimate that 1 million children benefit annually from this new treatment in 88 countries. That's a very great success and it's very concrete. And what is very concrete too is that UNITED alone wouldn't have achieved that. Um, if we needed, we needed collaboration to develop the treatment and we needed collaboration to scale up the project. And of course, I don't have time to develop that point, but it's very important for UNITED and for me personally. We work closely with civil society organizations in countries to make communities familiar with the project. My last point is that the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which we know now reminds us of how we must continue to work together more effectively. 
Um, we are facing a pandemic that strikes everyone, everywhere, and at the same time. And in this very specific context, we must continue to join our forces to work together for a global response when some countries, uh, as I already said, or some leaders defend what I would call something like uh, health egoism. Um, the unique partnership, ACTA, we launched uh, a few months ago, uh, was the best collective response we could hope. And it's the only way to defeat diseases and pandemics. Um, our common action against HIV, TB, and malaria since almost two decades proves that that's a good way, the best way to uh, achieve our uh, goals. And we have to adopt the same perspective for COVID-19 and for other diseases eating uh, low and middle income countries. Thank you, Ilona, and over to you. Thank, thank you, you very you. much, Marisol, and thank you for also opening up the spectrum of the issues that we're going to discuss, both, you know, the innovation, the working at country level, the interface between the GAP and ACTA and COVAX and others, and I encourage the other speakers to take up the issues like that. I'd like to move to Henrietta because it's so interesting, Henrietta, WHO and UNICEF, of course, have a very long history. Uh, and particularly the historical Alma-Ata Declaration, uh, the work on primary health care. And in a way, uh, some things have gone full circle, if I can call it that, that within the gap, uh, it is particularly UNICEF also that has pushed forward the accelerator on primary health care that has also helped together with Gavi to make sure that the whole challenge of vaccination is included in a concept of primary health care. What kind of added value does the gap have after such a long cooperation that has existed anyhow? Uh, thank you very much, Ilona. And it is uh, a great pleasure to join all of my colleagues here today. So um, let me build on something that Tedros said. He mentioned that uh, COVID-19 has really exposed the major weaknesses in our systems worldwide, and that is true. And let me build on something that Marisol mentioned, which was pediatric tuberculosis treatments. We take those innovations and we take them out to the field to help children. So a very short answer is that this collaboration makes a big difference in the world in how we interact with each other, and we are becoming stronger because of it. Uh, let me focus on the comment that you made about primary health care systems, Ilona, the Alma-Ata Declaration. I think it is probably the number one urgency that we see out in the world, which is that we need to build stronger primary health care around the world, globally. It is the number one issue for us. So um, all of this work needs to continue. Our collaboration as agencies is clearly stronger one year later after GAP, but a truly effective and sustainable response to COVID-19 will build on the discovery and deployment of new vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. But it also includes building health systems that are resilient to future shocks and available at the community level, accessible to all, no matter where they live. In short, addressing COVID-19 and reaching the SDG3 are two sides of the same coin. We cannot do one without the other. Before COVID struck, over 5 million children died from preventable causes every year, from pneumonia and diarrhea, malaria, and vaccine preventable conditions. 2.4 million children were born stillborn another fate we could avoid through better quality health care. And about 20 million children go without vital vaccinations every year. Again, this is a preventable situation. These are all areas where we can accelerate progress and build stronger health systems overall. And that is why we've been very proud to co-lead the primary health care accelerator under the Global Action Plan for SDG 3. And we have a lot to offer. We're bringing to bear our country level presence across 190 countries. 
our experts with deep and long-standing experience in delivering primary health care in a variety of difficult contexts, and our partnerships with governments to build stronger health platforms that can deliver a variety of services and interventions in one place where people live. Immunizations and malnutrition screening and treatment, maternal and newborn health care, as well as stronger wash and nutrition programming. In other words, these are all of the services that go into shaping a healthy life, whether it is younger or older, and stronger health systems. Now under COVID-19, we are adapting our programming and focusing on a few areas in particular that can help us to fight COVID, but also to build stronger health systems. This includes restarting immunization campaigns, many of which ground to a halt when the pandemic struck. In fact, we've reached 14.4 million children in Ethiopia with immunizations since the pandemic began. We've reached over 40 million women and children in 75 countries with essential health care services, including antenatal, delivery and postnatal care, newborn care, immunizations and screening for common childhood illnesses. We've helped train 2.8 million healthcare staff and community health workers in infection control and prevention. We've quickly scaled up our community engagement and social behavior change communication to reach 2.6 billion people with urgent COVID-19 messaging on prevention and service access, including in emergency settings. Because being able to deliver health services is not enough. We've also learned from experience on the ground about the importance of the demand for and acceptance of these services. Healthy practices in communities, in households, in schools, and in health centers. And now UNICEF is leading the procurement and delivery of COVID vaccines through the COVAX facility. We're very excited to be working with governments and manufacturers and with other partners to ensure that the vaccine is delivered fairly and equitably around the world. But across all of our work, short and long-term, whether related to COVID-19 or not, we need national leadership. Bringing the global action plan to life means making it as practical as possible at the country level. The plan represents a major change in how agencies, NGOs, and governments collaborate for stronger health systems. As a next step, UNICEF would like to suggest that we find practical ways to join up and streamline the administrative, financial, and reporting relationships at all levels. Closing the gaps between people and the health systems they need demands a global health architecture that is as streamlined and efficient and that it delivers to the poorest and to the most vulnerable, not only in the delivery of services on the ground, but across all of the administrative behind the scenes work that makes these services possible. So in closing, the UNICEF looks forward to working with our partners here today and with governments and communities worldwide to advance all of these important efforts. And thank you, Ilona. Thank you very much, Henrietta, for giving us this insight. And already we're seeing from the first uh, contributions how much the work on the GAP and uh, the work on the ACT Accelerator and COVAX is interfacing and uh, is uh, strengthening uh, each other. And I'd like to turn to Peter, who as a person, and of course, uh, with the role of his organization has very much been involved in both in the building up of the gap long before we had uh, COVID-19 and now the extraordinary building up of uh, ACTA and the different dimensions of ACTA. We speak about the vaccines a lot, but of course the therapeutics and the diagnostics where you are particularly active also, Peter, is, is critical. Could you share with us uh, some of that change that happened? You know, here was GAP, one was focusing on that collaboration, then comes COVID, then comes ACTA. How does all this come together and does it make the system stronger? Thanks, Elena. 
I think the starting point is that GAP was a very important step forward in changing the norms around how the 12 agencies thought about their roles and in catalyzing people across them um, to be much more aware of the imperatives of collaboration. I mean, looking at it now, it might kind of seem obvious to people that people from these different agencies should be working together um, to support countries. But actually, when you have these big agencies with distinct mandates, with very different operating models, and not enough resources to even achieve their core objectives, let alone help other agencies, actually, that wasn't the core expectation. And so I think GAP was very important in helping shift that norm. And in a way, I think if GAP uh, laid the foundation um, with the ACT Accelerator, what I think you're now seeing is the realization of the fruits of collaboration. We've learned some lessons along the way. There are things we're doing differently um, in the ACT Accelerator, but it is, I think, for anybody who's been working in global health for any period, an extraordinary mechanism in terms of the intensity of collaboration and how fast and effective it's proving. A good example of um, the kinds of things that have been done through the ACT Accelerator is the announcement just recently around the first two antigen RDTs or rapid diagnostic tests to um, receive WHO emergency use approval. Uh, we had a whole range of agencies find the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, UNITAID, Marisol's organization, UNICEF from a procurement perspective, the Global Fund, the Gates Foundation, WHO itself, CHAI, all working together to put together a package which both accelerated the evaluation and approval of these diagnostics, working with the two private sector companies, but then ensuring that it was possible to secure volume, buy the tests, deploy them with the appropriate guidance and technical assistance in the countries all rapidly. No, not none of the individual agencies had the full set of capabilities to provide that support to countries, but between us, we could do that. And that came together extraordinarily um, quickly. Um, so I think um, if you think of a journey um, of kind of laying foundations, of changing the norms, of making people think about um, how to get these big agencies to work together more effectively, um, that I think was really important in setting the platform. And then ACTOR, I think, is showing what the real promise is of, of doing this. And what I think as we go through this crisis, we should seize the opportunity to feed back some of what we've learned through the ACT Accelerator back into the core um, uh, machinery, so to speak, of um, GAP itself. Ultimately, the real test of any of this is not though whether GAP is a success or whether ACT Accelerator is a success. Um, but is whether or not we actually do what we, in a sense, is written on the can, is we accelerate the progress towards health and well-being for all. And we have to start from the harsh truth that 2020 is a year in which we've gone backwards. We've been knocked back uh, on this. And if anything, that accentuates the importance of of pulling together and working together to help countries and communities, not just to beat COVID-19, and we are in the middle of that fight um, right now, but also I think the big thing we need to do is turn the fight against COVID-19 into uh, an, a moment where we rethink the role of health in society and in the economy. I mean, COVID-19 has been an extraordinary lesson on what disease can do to an economy. We've had the biggest crisis far eclipsing the global financial crisis as a result of a pathogen. So if we, if we haven't managed to sort of close the gap in communication between economic policymakers and health leaders, 
that I don't know what it would take. But we've also got to see it not just in terms of protecting against the downside from a disease like COVID, because equally powerful are the upsides. The, as humans, we tend to be much better at looking at the things that we've lost than, than the things we've never had. But the reality is, is if you do the calculations on what you would benefit from as a society, as an economy, for getting rid of TB or getting rid of malaria, the numbers are equally as large. The upside is huge um, from that. And so we need to get people to think differently about um, the nature of the problem. I also think as a community, and this goes right across from the scientists, um, the different agencies, we need to use the way we have been responding to COVID-19 as a catalyst to think differently about the nature of the task we have in general. I'm very struck by the fact that we will end this year with either TB or COVID-19 being the biggest infectious disease killer in the world. Both of them will probably kill somewhere around one and a half million people. It's not a race we want either to win, but they will be the two biggest killers. But there the similarity ends. Because for one thing, on January the 1st, we will know, roughly speaking, within 90, 95% accuracy, how many people died of COVID-19. To get that number for TB, we'll probably wait till October. Um, we just have a different way of thinking about data. Total global spending on TB treatment and delivery and prevention is about six and a half billion dollars. The number for COVID-19, well, it's way over a hundred times as much. Um, uh, the pipeline of drugs, diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, and so on for COVID-19 is numbered in the hundreds. I can think of maybe, I maybe get to two hands when I think of, um, uh, biomedical advances that we're looking at for TB in 2021. And so the thing I take from this is if we can do this for COVID-19, and we haven't yet won, but we are certainly marshalling a global response of unprecedented um, impact and resources, why don't we have the same level of ambition for some of these other diseases. Because if we really want to accelerate the path to health and well being for all, that's the kind of ambition we need. And yes, it will require the kind of collaboration underpinned by the Global Action Plan and that we're demonstrating um, through ACTA. But ultimately, it also requires the will and the, and the belief that it can be um, done. So that, that's. Um, we both need to beat COVID-19 and we need it to, as a catalyst, to have a, a different level of ambition about what we do. Over. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you for widening uh, the perspective in that way and uh, giving a wonderful inroad also to asking Jeremy to give some of his comments. Jeremy, you and your staff were there at the beginning of the gap, then you've been very, very involved in the ACTA and various dimensions. But also given uh, the global situation and your involvement and these learning processes that Peter has spoken about, your own uh, foundation, your own organization and its ambition has changed in the sense, I think, uh, also due to this uh, a pressure, I believe, that uh, Peter has shared with us that we need to have this level of ambition for a whole range of diseases and, of course, for health systems as well. So could you share some of your experiences with us when you sort of came into the global health community uh, and started to experience this cooperation and you yourself and your organization the Wellcome Trust contributing so much to it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, no, it's a, a pleasure to join and, and like everybody else, thank the uh, German Ministry of Health and indeed the World Health Summit. And I, I see Detlef there, so thank you very much indeed. It's a 
pleasure and an honor to join Marisol and Dr. Tedros, Henrietta, Peter and, and Mohammed on, on, on the panel. Um, great shame we can't be in Berlin, but let's try and make sure that we're there next year, Elena, um, and together if we possibly can, because I'm fed up of Zoom, yeah, much as it's been good. Um, yeah, I'm going to pick up on, I won't name each individual because I'm actually going to pick a few thoughts across from, from, from everybody. Um, uh, research is, is obviously critical to all this, but I think the gap itself, which and we were, as you know, uh, welcome, along with many partners involved in writing something of the, uh, uh, of the research component of the, of the gap. Uh, but, but what the ACT Accelerator has shown, and, and uh, Peter alluded to this, is, is that research on its own is not enough. Um, it has to come together with a broad coalition um, of agencies, of organizations, and peoples from different backgrounds in order to make that research a reality for people's lives. So, so there's two aspects I'd like to pick up on research itself and multilateralism, because I think multilateralism research can often be seen more in the abstract than the concrete, uh, that the, the ideas don't necessarily translate into what people feel are affecting them day to day. Uh, and they can often be seen to be far removed from actually making uh, everybody's life better rather than some people's life better. And I think for me, the, the gap, and Tedros said it actually, the, the ACT Accelerator for me is almost an embodiment of the gap. And, you know, the ACT Accelerator has been set up to do really a specific thing in relation to COVID and what its future is will have to be discussed in the long term. But in essence, it's a sister or a, a child of gap, really. And I think the lessons learned from the ACT Accelerator um, can be then pu pushed through into the gap and the wonderful 12 agencies that came together last year at the World Health Summit to, to officially uh, launch. And the reason why I wanted to pick up on multilateralism and research together is, is because I think they do share some common features. I'd like to think that in the last few years, in a sense, um, the world has looked into the abyss of nationalism and decided that a, unit, a nationalistic approach is not going to be able to answer the great challenges of the 21st century. And COVID, of course, has brought that into stark relief, where essentially every village, every town, every country has been affected. It's uh, pushed forward the uh, fault lines in, in all of our societies. Uh, and it's also affected rich and poor. Uh, it's affected every country and it's brought out those inequalities. And ACT did come together and, and I pay tribute here to the, uh, the hosting organization, the WHO, uh, and the team there led by Bruce and of course under Tedros's guidance is, has done an absolutely amazing job to bring these organizations together and contribute in a positive way. And what essentially it's doing, whether in in, in health systems that Henrietta talked about, or in primary health care, Peter, or in uh, the treatments that we're working so closely with Unitaid on, or indeed uh, the vaccines. What it's done is say to people, we would rather contribute 10% to making the world a better place and changing the world, than we would con like to contribute 100% to doing something small. And that giving up of some degree of autonomy, some degree of your own organizational background and everything else in order to contribute to something more, I think is at the heart of the ACT Accelerator. And I think it's at the heart actually of where the gap uh, can now develop and mature out of the lessons learned uh, from the ACT Accelerator. And, and if we can do that, and if we can not just put aside our in organizational background and our own strategic plans, but, but also to see that there is great benefit in, in working with others in a greater partnership, and that we can demonstrate that multilateralism actually works in the concrete. It can ensure there is oxygen supplies in countries. It can ensure there's diagnostics. Through Unitaid and, and ourselves, we can ensure that treatment reaches those that need it. And of course, vaccines are available uh, to all in a multilateral way. And at the start, not added on at a later date, that equitable access is at the forefront of everybody's commitments from the start. Not added on, as frankly we did in my early days of my career with access to HIV drugs in the late 1990s, but we're ensuring that equitable access to everything we're talking about, from vaccines to treatment, to diagnostics, to oxygen, to PPE and health systems is at the front of it. And with that, I think the gap can pick up where ACT will 
not necessarily finished, but where act has taken us. And lastly, just pay tribute as well to the, the World Bank. Mohammed will come next, but uh, his leadership at the World Bank has been absolutely instrumental in where Act A has got. And finally, a plea that when we're talking about this, we don't, um, uh, that we shift the debate on from overseas development assistance funding and short term money and see this as investment, not just in health, but in economies and well being and the growth. Uh, of the world and the protection of the world. And that will need more robust discussions, not just with overseas development aid money, but also with financial ministers and ensuring that there is investment in health and therefore the economies in the future, not relying on soft money and also push governments that they, when they make commitments to honor them. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you very much for providing the inroad into uh, the contribution by Mohammed and of course with sort of two hats, both of them related very much also to new mechanisms of, uh, of financing. Mohammed, if you can share with us also the kind of thinking that was developed under your leadership also in the gap in relation to the financing accelerator, but then also as Jeremy has said, the role in uh, the Act A and uh, and maybe some of the thinking that is going on in terms to this shift uh, to finance global common goods uh, that has become uh, such a strong dimension of the discussions around COVID-19. Please, Mohammed, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Ilona, and thank you for inviting us to this extreme closing panel of the World Health Summit. I think if COVID-19 and not only the health, but the economic impact of it doesn't uh, unify our mind on the centrality of multilateralism for solving complex problems, I don't know what else can, uh, because we've seen an unprecedented challenge that affects countries at all income levels, not only the high income, but also the lowest incomes across the whole spectrum in terms of the consequences of this pandemic. So the idea of the gap in a way of making global collaboration work, work better, but also importantly work for countries. I think it's an important one. Even before COVID-19, uh, as Dr. Tedros mentioned, the, um, the, the action plan that we signed committed us to work together, but to make that collaboration work at the country level. COVID-19 has only uh, uh, sort of uh, increased the necessity for us to do so. And to give you a sense of what we're trying to solve, I'll tell you the story of a Minister of Health from a low income country who discussed with us about 12 months ago, I'll say before COVID, that look, we appreciate all the support from the global partners. We've got lots of partners coming through trying to help us, but we've got a problem much of what they're trying to do is not really aligned with our strategy as a country. And the way they go about it also undermines potentially our institutional capabilities. Now, unless we are able to translate the idea of global collaboration in terms of helping countries move forward on the SDG3 and to achieve the results, even before COVID, by working together around the country context, the country needs, the country priorities and the country leadership, we would not be able to solve that problem. Now, COVID-19 has exposed the fiscal uh, limitations that many countries will face over time. That means it's even more important now that we're aligned at the hip in how we support countries to do that, either through evidence-based policy dialogue regarding how they finance their health sectors, how they organize service delivery, and we're beginning to see that in terms of ACTA, or how we provide technical assistance to countries in terms of the public financial management, in terms of also really in configuring the service delivery infrastructure around primary health care across the entities that we have uh, around the GAP agenda, or joint funding, to what extent we actually come together around their plans with the domestic resources in line, but also support that in a way that complements them to get them to where they need to be. And also learn together as we do that, because shared learning is part of it. I think COVID-19 has also taught us to be 
a bit more humble. I think if there's no, if, if there's a humbling moment for the global health uh, community, I think the global community as a whole, I think COVID-19 is one of them because it's a pandemic that has hit us and we've struggled. Despite tremendous leadership by WHO and several others, and here we have all the principles of the actor, we see in progress. But I think we should also be humble that the solutions also, a large part of it is at the country level. And so learning what works and what doesn't at the country level, uh, apart from sort of joint learning network would be an important element in terms of that. The GFF itself, through its communities of practice, has used and several of the partners, uh, Global Fund, Gavi, WHO have been involved in terms of harnessing the learnings in country, how they are protecting, but also responding to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, protecting essential services, but also responding to the pandemic. And I will say a few uh, examples of how we've sort of seen this unfold. One is, for instance, Ghana, which played a major role in terms of the gap itself. And uh, the fact that we've got a long-term plan for technical assistance to Ghana, not short-term ad hoc, because how we deliver the technical assistance itself matters. Or in Cote d'Ivoire, where there's a joint platform for pursuing health financing reforms, led primarily initially by the Global Fund, but we've all rallied around it to work together around uh, the government of Ivory Coast on health financing reforms, increasing allocation for the health sector and trying to really stretch that uh, resource allocated to get more health for the people of uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Or in Laos, where we have a co-financing agreement with the Global Fund and where we are co-financing a common program in a much more seamless manner than what we had done previously. I think there's still a long road ahead of us in that direction, but that's an example. And this morning we're speaking to Gavi to sort of see how can we try to look at what we've done with the Global Fund and try to also do that in other countries around health system strengthening. Or in DRC, where collectively by working together, providing technical support to countries, advocating together, we've been able to see increase in the domestic allocation to health from seven to 10%. This was before COVID. So in, in, in sum, we've got no option if we're really serious about achieving results at the country level than to find ways to coordinate better and to support national leadership, national institutions to drive the change that we want to see at the country level. The global collaboration is not for the global collaboration itself. It's really global collaboration to work for countries. And I think that's what this is all about uh, from our side. And finally, um, which I believe we can uh, speak also to, is the importance of shared accountability. Because if we sort of put a national governments uh, at the leadership position, and each of our respective institutions comes around and supports based on our comparative advantages, then we also need to bring in the voices that will help us all be honest in terms of to what extent are we making progress and what are, where are we falling short and what can we do more uh, better? And I think this is the mechanism and the gap has proven to be a tool for doing that. And for us at the GFF and the World Bank, our strategy refresh, as well as um, the direction that we're taking in the context of COVID is all in line with all of this uh, to support action at the country level. And with ACTA and with Global Fund, we've been calling in the health systems connector pillar essentially in a very similar direction, but with a focus on the COVID-19 tools. So the learnings, I think, through the gap has made it easier. But as we move forward, I think we will have to do a lot of catch up in terms of where we've lost ground as a result of the pandemic. So thank you, uh, and I'll hand it over to you, Alona. Thank you very much, Mohammed, And thank you also for sort of opening up a bit uh, to what I'd like to spend the next half hour on, sort of looking ahead, how we build on uh, what has been achieved. Because if we think back uh, just two years, I don't think any of us would have dared hoped that the cooperation uh, because of, despite of the crises, has increased so significantly between the agencies as it has. And I think for many of our audience, it's important to say 
how much the day-to-day -day communication between the principals of the agencies, uh, their staff, and the interface with the countries has increased significantly. And uh, therefore, the question is, you know, how uh, do we want to move forward? What opportunities are there to move forward? And I'm so happy to see that Dr. Tedros has still been able to stay with us. And uh, I'd like to ask him, first of all, since he is here with us, you know, if, if you look uh, forward, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, I'm always teased by the global health community because I keep speaking of this thing called the cosmopolitan moment, which comes out of political science and says, you know, a crisis can actually give you the opportunity for a significant positive change. And Peter has alluded to that uh, in some way also. What do you think are the required innovations and opportunities at this stage, uh, Dr. Tedros, that we must uh, pick up and that perhaps not only the agencies that are here, but really the member states, the boards, the uh, 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 the leaders, uh, the political leaders of these agencies uh, should be taking up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ilona. Um, I was really sitting back and relaxing and listening to my colleagues. So <laughs> uh, if you give me this opportunity, then um, it will not be fair for my colleagues to get another round and the first one. So I would appreciate actually if our other colleagues could could say, uh, could could um, you know have their contribution on this, and then I will I will take letter. I will stay. Okay, with you. let's yeah. do it. I'm used to that yeah. from you. That you know, yes, I yes. ask you, and then you say, "Let the others talk first, and I'll come in." <laughs> Jeremy, can I throw this at you? What are the opportunities that need to be uh, taken up and who do we need to take them up because uh, for so long countries have criticized the agencies you're not working together you're not doing your job properly etc cetera, etc cetera. now to some extent the agencies are so where are the countries who else must push yeah no, i'll i'll take pick up tedros you re, you relax <laughs> um uh, I think Mohammed said it actually, whatever it, health education, I think education is not my field, but there, there's so many similarities. Things start and they end with communities. That, that's where we've, the, the shift in the center of gravity, I think is the, the crucial element to this. And number two is delivering on what we've promised rather than overly promising. Um, I think that the, not yet, but I hope the success of the ACT Accelerator, as I said, will demonstrate that cooperation, collaboration, partnership, multilateralism are not just nice warm words that get tossed around in global health arenas, but they can actually deliver. And they can deliver the concrete changes that communities need to, to have their lives better. And if we can do that, then I think we can look back on the last five difficult years of nationalism, and I don't name any countries, but, but, but there has been a shift in that. And I think we can look back and, and argue that actually uh, a common approach coming together, aligning country offices of all of our agencies so that the country leads and that within countries, communities lead, uh, and we actually deliver. Um, we underpromise and we overdeliver, and if we do that, then I think we've made the concrete case for this coming together, not in the abstract, but in the concrete. Thank you, Jeremy. Peter, how would you see that? Hi, sorry. Um, the disadvantage of having multiple screens is you end up with your <laughs> cursor or sitting on the wrong screen. Um, I would just echo some of the points that Jeremy made. Um, I'd first like to pick up on the language around communities. Um, I, I do think it's in, incredibly important that um, as agencies, we are humble about our position in this. And one of the 
hesitations I always had about the language of the Global Action Plan is it made it sound like the 12 agencies were going to make things happen. Whereas actually what we are is enablers for countries, but importantly, and this is where I think Jeremy made inform, it's communities that count. And we also have to pick up on the fact that and recognize the fact that not all countries pay enough attention to all their communities. And if we really believe in universal health coverage, that it has to be truly universal and the most marginalized, the most politically unpopular, um, the vulnerable, the poorest are included. And both as agencies and as countries, as governments, that doesn't happen necessarily automatically. Um, and and we, I think we do need to put a particular focus, both in the COVID response and in the broader agenda, on reaching out to those who are furthest behind or most um, left behind. A couple of other um, points that I think um, I've really um, seen as powerful in the way that um, the ACT Accelerator works. One is this end-to-end -end notion. Certainly from a global fund perspective, I'm finding myself much more involved in R&D related issues um, than I would typically be on HIV, TB and malaria. My takeaway from that is I need to be more involved in R&D issues on HIV, TB and malaria because the way that through the actor mechanism, and we're doing it because we're trying to collapse everything in terms of time frame and make it faster. But the reality is if we can make it happen in this environment, why can't we make it happen um, on, uh, on other things? And so I think that end-to-end -end perspective is um, incredibly important. The second thing I think that is um, very um, important critical in the way the ACT Accelerator is working is the focus on outcomes, on making sure that everything we're doing is geared around, will it reduce infections? Will it save lives? Will it stop the economic and social um, uh, chaos? You know, how, how, can we, how can we change things for the people who are actually living um, uh, through this? And this I think is always a challenge in things around multilateral collaboration. It's very easy, given the complexity of all our organizations and things, to get lost in process and to kind of lose sight of what it is you're trying to do and to have one meeting justifying the notion of another meeting. And we, we need to keep that ultimate focus on outcomes, whether it's the specific outcomes relating to COVID-19 or in my case around HIV, TB and malaria or the bigger, broader outcome of health and well-being um, for, for all. If we lose sight of those, we'll just kind of be busy um, and lose sight of what we're here for. So I think there are re some real things that are very important in the way that we um, both deliver on the promise of the ACT Accelerator. And as <laughs> Jeremy alluded to, we haven't proven yet it works, the early indications are very encouraging, but we have to beat COVID to prove it works. Um, and then how do we leverage that, in a sense, back into the global action plan to make that even more effective to accelerate progress to health and well-being for all? Over. Thank you, Peter. Henrietta, can I ask you to follow through on that, perhaps with a gender lens? Within the gap, there has been a lot of discussion about you know, how to include in terms of the access and equity issues, the gender issues, the social determinant issues, the discrimination issues. And you as a woman leader, and of course with uh, the task that UNICEF has to which also women are, are so linked up. Uh, and now our experience that uh, on top of all the discrimination, we have, you know, additional burden put on women and uh, vulnerable groups through COVID-19. How is that reflected in your work and how must we take that into account both uh, in our scientific approaches, but particularly at the country level in the work and primary health care? 
Ilona, you have just said it. I mean, it is what we need to do as a world. Um, often we leave the women out either because um, of their research or because of their voices at the table or because they are truly overworked in businesses and they are frontline workers and they're not getting trained and they're bearing the brunt in both time and access. So one of the areas um, building on what Mohammed and Jeremy and Peter uh, were saying is when we are looking at civil society organizations who are our partners in the field, who are there before, during and after many of these emergencies, the women are the largest group so make sure that we are listening to the women in every one of these communities and societies. And to Mohammed and Peter's point, when we do country gatherings, make sure that we've got women at the table so that they are in the most important decision-making moments. And if so, the women will provide an aspect, a way of gauging whether communities and countries will have an uptake of services. We cannot offer services or vaccines if people do not take them. And the women will be a key. So uh, you have rightly mentioned the gender dimension. It will be a key for all of us as we think about the acceptance of vaccines. The second one is, um, Ilona, one of our problems is that we have a lot of children in a vaccine plentiful world who are zero dose, who never get a vaccine. And it's because they're hard to reach or they're in communities that are left behind. So to Jeremy and Peter's point about uh, the poorest and the most marginalized, if we can't reach them, we will never be able to accomplish all the higher ambition that Peter would like from all of us and we would like from ourselves because we simply can't reach them. So we have to find ways to reach them. Social media is one that is rising, traditional um, uh, communication systems, but we have to conquer these and we have to start now because it is not just a solution that we think will work for the world. It is a solution that they think will work in their family, in their village. And we have to start that communications now. So the women will be important and the communities that are often left behind are going to be very important. Thank you very much, Henrietta. Marisol, there's a thing going through my head that uh, I wonder if you can answer. I know that uh, many of us were intrigued when this new financing model for Unitaid was developed, uh, part of it being, you know, getting money from uh, airline tickets. And uh, that was considered, you know, very, very innovative. We actually hoped that more airlines than finally did would take it up. And, it would become a possibility to finance global goods. Now, of course, the airlines are grounded and we see that a, a model that we thought, you know, was very future oriented has actually reached a certain limit. And uh, so we are challenged in, in this world. And I think Jeremy was the person who also referred to it that uh, we need to move away from the old models of financing and uh, have you know, uh, quite an innovative approach also here. And Mohammed, I'd like you also to pick up on that, please, uh, after Marisol. What options do we have in terms of, of financing uh, these new approaches and uh, particularly to have impact on country level? Uh, thank you, Ilona. Um, I, I'm going to answer your question in just one second, but uh, uh, first, I, I would like to come back to uh, sure. uh, something that Jeremy said and also uh, Peter about the fact that um, we are in a very specific situation in which COPE and, and you, you yourself said that um, uh, our agencies are cooperating very much and uh, that uh, we have been able in a few months to do what we have dreamt during years and years. Um, I, I would like to say that uh, the paradox is that the cooperation between our ad agencies has certainly increased, but at the same time, the perception uh, in public opinions 
is that multilateral organization don't work well. And so we have something which is a kind of gap uh, uh, between what we do and, and the way it is perceived. And if we are honest, cooperation doesn't exist since COVID-19. We have been cooperating since 20 years ago against HIV, TB, and malaria with more, with, with more, um, more or less success, but uh, with um, great achievements in some cases and less uh, interesting results in other fields, but we have been working together. And I am very, uh, I, I, I'm really convinced by uh, what Jeremy was saying, that we have to explain and to prove and to show how concrete our cooperations are and how concrete the results of our work as organization is for uh, the population, for the people, for the uh, sick people. Because when we say what we do, when we say what we have been able to achieve, people realize, I can see that in everywhere, uh, everywhere where I go and, and talk about that, people realize that international and multilateral organizations are not just an abstract concept, but very concrete uh, um, institutions, so very concrete institutions. So I, I, I want to make that point because it, it wouldn't be fair to say that cooperation has um, uh, resulted from COVID-19 very recently. It exists since uh, uh, at least uh, 20 years ago, what I call personally concrete multilateral organizations. But, um, on, on the question of funding, um, UNITEX, um, uh, funding model is very interesting, even if we don't ask our donors uh, to uh, uh, give uh, to fund us uh, with a tax on, on air uh, ticket. Uh, they can fund us with the money they want to give us, and, and it's their choice. And in the discussion we have, but in the discussion we have with um, the countries, they are very much interested by this model, uh, even if they don't talk about air. Uh, tickets, for instance, but um, uh, they talk about other um, bases for uh, uh, giving us funds. Uh, for instance, uh, one country said, well, we could invent a tax on, on the, um, people going to hotels, uh, to hotel rooms. Uh, we could have a tax on, on tourism and uh, affect it to international organizations. So we can find different ways. What is important in my perception is that uh, the public, public opinion of uh, rich countries have to feel that um, we don't ask them more and more every time for new causes and that we try to invent new models independently from national tax policies. Uh, I'm a French person and as you know in France the tax rate is very high and so what I am saying is very important even for, for French public opinion. They want to pay, they want to fund multilateral policies, but they don't want to have their own taxes um, uh, raise and raise uh, again. So I, I think we should invent um, new models of cooperation between national corporations, countries' uh, commitment, and organization specific funding. Um, we have to convince the countries where we intervene to uh, um, invest uh, humanly with human resources, with training, um, with uh, political attention to those um, policies we are we are implementing, and not only uh, be in, a, in you know uh, as if uh, we were to pay and they were to receive that kind of cooperation between national corporations and countries' investment is for me something which is very important. Thank you, Marisol. Mohammed, global digital tax to finance global health. What are we going to do? I, I think we have to be creative because in a couple of areas, as we rebuild, uh, to think about not rebuilding inefficient systems or system that we are not optimal to start with, but to think about how we uh, reconfigure and the focus of primary healthcare systems 
and using digital technology, for instance, and how we organize frontline health workers, I think is one path that many countries can make do uh, with the resources that they have, but stretch that uh, by just being more allocatively more efficient. That's one. In terms of other areas of taxation, I think countries will also have to look at that. I think at the bank, we're beginning a conversation across sectors in terms of pro-health taxes, because at a time when ministries of finance will be trying to raise resources, I think it might be also worthwhile to sort of think about how can those efforts really align with not only changing behaviors that are going to be more pro-health, but also if the resources are raised to what extent can more of that actually get to finance and health. So I think that um, we have to really think um, uh, creatively in the period ahead. And I think in terms of the gap itself and where we go from here, back to the earlier question you asked, at the end of the day, it's leadership really that, that and leadership of the institutions or leadership as a plural, not, um, not, a, not, 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 um, not a singular, but also as a verb that it's what people act to exercise leadership within institutions across the levels of the institution, including at the country level, and enabling countries to step up uh, to really lead and for us to listen to them as well. This is a change that we'll have to uh, continue to work on. I, think, I don't think we're anywhere near where we should be. So it's work in progress. But for the gap to deliver on its promise, we have to actually walk the talk. And at the end of the day, if we don't deliver on the expectations that we've raised, I think it will become irrelevant. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Jeremy, I'd just like to jump back to you for a question that comes up again and again in this context of financing global health and the criticism that, you know, large and rich foundations like your own, uh, like the Gates Foundation and others, uh, have more influence and less accountability in how they contribute to global health than maybe other funders. How do you respond to that and where do you see solutions for a real cooperation on priorities that have been set? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Lona, and, and I think it's a, it's a very fair question to, to all of us and, and particularly to, to foundations who have their own money. So, so thank you for asking. I, I, I think it's, it comes through transparency. I, I think transparency is, is where the accountability can lie and, being, and, and of course, therefore also being open to criticism when, you, uh, when you, you make decisions which don't align with country needs or regional needs or agencies that come with more accountability. In, in normal traditional uh, ways that that's measured. So I, I think um, transparency is the absolute key to keep in mind who you're accountable to. We believe we're accountable to societies and to communities within those societies and to keep that at the forefront of all your thinking. Uh, you're not accountable to yourselves or to your own organization. I think you are accountable uh, to societies and to the communities within them. And then how do you measure yourself against those and how do you deliver uh, not a series of activities, but uh, a series of impacts that are measurable, uh, that others can measure and can hold you account as an organization for delivering on the benefits you get of being a foundation. So I don't think there's a simple answer that you can give that you'll be elected out or elected in like a, in, a, in, a democratic in a democratic country or other. Uh, but I think we can get there. In fact, I think we can do at least as well, if not better sometimes, uh, by being absolutely radically transparent about the things that we do. Can I just make one other comment though, just to build off, and, and that is again, uh, again, over the last few years, I think there's been a questioning, you know, and this happens at uh, various times, I think, in as, as, as countries and organizations go through change and, and evolution and naturally ask questions. A question of what is the role of the public sector? And the private sector is absolutely critical in delivering many things and industry has really stepped up, including in the ACT Accelerator. But I think for me, COVID has also demonstrated countries have an absolute responsibility to invest in things. And actually only countries can do that. And I think one of the things I would take away from uh, the lessons as we eventually learn them of COVID is investment in public services. They may be delivered in certain jurisdictions by private sector or others, 
but you cannot shrink the country responsibilities to a level below which things become untenable and, and not possible. And the, uh, the neglect, sometimes willful neglect and undermining of public institutions, I think has been very damaging in the build up to and the response to COVID in a number of countries, including very rich ones. Thank you. Peter, can I just ask you to comment? I mean, you came to this global health world originally as a banker, somebody who knows a lot about investment and, uh, and financing models. And uh, how do you see it uh, developing in the global health sphere? Can we continue with this donor-based uh, fundraising uh, bonanzas, etc.? How do you think we can actually finance common goods? Well, I think the starting point is that we need political leaders within countries to understand the social and economic benefits from health and to invest more in health. I mean, that is the basic uh, uh, reality and underinvestment in the public health aspects of health um, has been uh, part of the reason we have struggled to respond effectively um, uh, to COVID-19 in many parts of, of, of the world. I mean, when I, before I came to the Global Fund, I was at Harvard looking at the economics of financing of global health. And I struggled to persuade people like the IMF and financial, various financial institutions to take the threats and issues of global health more seriously than they did. And I was singularly unsuccessful, if I'm honest, um, uh, at making any progress on that whatsoever. Now, COVID-19 has, has, has dramatically changed that picture. And what I think we need to do is ensure that that change um, isn't just a sort of flash in the pan, that it goes away as soon as the crisis goes away, but that it institutionalizes a different type of dialogue between health leaders and economic and financial leaders. I also think business um, needs to think about its role in global health differently. One of the last things I did um, at Harvard before I came to the Global Fund was spoil um, a research assistant's summer by getting her to look at the uh, annual reports of the Fortune 500 companies, all 500 of them, and look at how many of them had strategies and metrics relating to the climate change and the environment, and how many of them had strategies and metrics relating to global health. And what was interesting was that 72% of them had a strategy with respect to the environment, and 10% of them had a strategy with respect to global health. And actually, if you stripped out the pharmaceutical industry, virtually none of them um, had a strategy. And this wasn't always true. If you went back actually a decade ago, actually none of those companies would have had climate change or environmental strategies. And one of the things I think we need to do more broadly than just thinking about sort of economic and financial institutions and finance ministers and so on, is to use this crisis to trigger businesses to think differently about their role. I did a presentation just recently to um, a bunch of um, CEOs and people from the asset management and banking industry. And I said to them, look, this is almost a joke, but actually it's true, which is that the people in the ACT Accelerator are probably going to have more impact on your share price as people running banks and asset managers than you are because the thing that is gonna make a difference to your share price is whether there's a vaccine, whether there's an effective therapeutic um, and so on. So you should be deeply interested in what we are doing. Now that kind of mindset of the interconnection um, between them just isn't there. The other thing I think we need to do and we need to learn from what the green movement has done is the green movement has been really good at changing the narrative from being one in which spending money on protecting the environment we live in to, from being a cost to being an investment. 
to being about job creation and about new types of innovation and economic opportunity. We, we need to do the same with global health. We could make the world a much healthier, safer place. And we could frame that not just as a, another investment, something donors have to invest in and so on, but something that actually creates a whole new set of economic opportunities, job opportunities, innovation opportunities for people. So I think by reframing the relationship between health and the economy, we can, we can get ourselves to a, um, a much better place and, re and really accelerate progress to this goal, which I think is the fabulous goal of health and well-being for all. Thank you, Peter. And we don't have the time now to actually go into the different financing models, the different organizations that are here um, represent. And I would have loved to go back to Henrietta in terms of, you know, the arguments that bring normal people, I'm thinking of Halloween also, uh, to actually, you know, give a dollar, ten dollars or whatever to a venture like UNICEF. But it does give uh, the indication that we, as you already indicated, Henrietta, we do need to get closer to people as well. And I think this is also some of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Tedros has done with uh, trying to reach out to new communities, to work with the music community, to many different uh, types of actors to say, you know, this is also your agenda. This is our joint world. This is how we should take this forward. So we have, we're coming to the end of this panel. We have two more uh, uh, short commentaries. First of all, from Dr. Tedros, who promised us some comments after he listened. And then of course, in case any of you wondered why Dr. Detlef Ganten is here on this panel uh, and I have not called on him, it is because he is going to officially uh, close uh, the World Health Summit 2020 after Dr. Tedros has spoken. So I take this opportunity to already thank the panel for what I thought was a really interesting discussion, taking you know, the gap as a starting point and raising and discussing some of the big challenges in global health at this point in time. Please, Dr. Tedros. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, the advantage of being the last speaker is I fully agree with what my colleague said, so I endorse. <laughs> then maybe to underline from some of what they said is, uh, country at the center is the most important thing. And when we say country at the center, it means the impact and result that the country wants. So that's really key. And I fully share with what Mohammed said, by the way, uh, when I was minister, I used to ask exactly the same question. And that's why we ended up um, installing a basket funding. And most of the agencies and most of the donors agreed actually to join. So if the country wants it, I think that's one of the pull factor that will help us to, to align. So, um, you know, crucial is uh, the country. Second thing I would like to comment is for ACT Accelerator, it's easy because we know what we want, the vaccines, the therapeutics, and so on. We know the countries want those things, so we can move on. But if it's the bigger SDG agenda, the priorities from country to country varies. So we have to listen to the countries very, very seriously because the ACT -A experience cannot be just translated as is into the SDG bigger uh, action plan. So again, it's listening to the countries, doing it based on their priorities, which will be very important. So with that, thank you so much, Ilona. And uh, thank you, Dr. Professor Ganten also for uh, staying with us. And I hope he will have a few words. Now you will excuse me, I will be rushing out to receive a, a Senate president from Uzbekistan, by the way. And I will share with her the issues we discussed uh, today. So thank you so much and see you uh, soon in another uh, in a, a platform uh, of our, ours. Thank, thank you, you very you. much, Dr. Thank Tedros. You. Thank you. And thank you, of course, also for being a patron of the World Health Summit together with, uh, with others. 
thank you again to all the panelists and uh, please stay with us while uh, Dr. Detlef Ganten closes this extraordinary first time virtual World Health Summit. Please Detlef, over to you. Well, thank you, Ilona, and thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, please go and get your present. <laughs> you, you really deserve it. And I've been listening to this uh, session as I've been listening to many other sessions. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the World Health Summit, as I think with this uh, final comments, all the other speakers and those who listened uh, to the World Health Summit. I myself learned a lot. And I've talked to many people, and they, uh, I think, uh, were very grateful that we had this World Health Summit despite of the special situation. We have had uh, more than 6,000 uh, participants in the summit, more than in a real summit, actually, from 100, 100 countries. So, uh, in a way, by uh, communication, this was a very successful summit, and, and uh, by the quality of contributions, I think this was exceptional. Um, and this also shows that uh, despite of the physical distance, we have created something new with COVID-19 and with type of uh, summit being organized completely digital, we have created a feeling of togetherness, which uh, before some people, some people of us of course felt, but uh, not everybody as much as they should for if we consider this important topic. As you know, the World Health Summit is organized by the M8 Alliance, that is an academic institution uh, of 30 major academic health centers around the world, and importantly, 140 ac academies of medicine and sciences around the world. So it's a fantastic network of academia. But uh, you see the claim in front of me, science innovation policies, academia, of course, can do science, but alone they can do and can achieve very little. We do need all parts of society. We need, of course, politics. We need to innovate. We need the private industry to bring innovation to the street and to the people and to the patients. And we need to work together with civil society if we are uh, not kind of in, in coordination with what the people want, then we are not achieving what we need to do. The MA Alliance is, uh, after every meeting, uh, editing a uh, M8 Alliance declaration of the major points. And let me just give you some of these major points. And one is that we are actually taking up uh, things which have been said in, a, in the very sessions and, and speeches. And one was which impressed us, we feel is very important, that is no one is safe until all are safe. And we call upon everybody, especially also the politicians, to act accordingly. The second one is, and I think we all agree on that, and this session was testimony to it, the World Health Summit stands by its deep commitment to multilateralism, health diplomacy, and international cooperation in science, research, and all other areas. And the World Health Summit stands steadfast in its support of WHO as well as other supporting organization. In addition, the required COVID-19 responses range far beyond the global health organizations. And that is why the World Health Summit is clear and the M8 Alliance declares its rejection to any vaccine nationalism. And then going beyond COVID-19, the COVID virus, COVID virus, of course, has highlighted the fault lines in health systems around the world. And the World Health Summit and the M8 Alliance reiterates its deep commitment to universal health coverage. And let me conclude finally, <clears throat> the World Health Summit will continue to promote integrated holistic approaches to global challenges such as one health, planetary health, because uh, in addition to COVID-19, of course, as was said in this meeting as well in the last session, all other diseases remain important and we have to do everything to make, to improve global health in addition to the acute crisis and especially also to support holistic, comprehensive 
prevention programs. Prevention in the long run is cheaper than treatment. Finally, let me say thank you again. Let's keep on working together. And uh, the COVID-19 crisis has shown we have to work together in order to achieve what we need to achieve, global health. Thank you all for supporting uh, the international collaboration and thank you for participating in the World Health Summit 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.